so many of the feelings that underlie anorexia, fear of becoming a woman, fear of becoming an adult, fear of being sexualized, also lie behind the um, disproportionate number of teenage girls who are saying they want to be non-binary or boys. Um, it's a very similar kind of motivation. Between the ages of 14 and 17, the Sunday Times columnist Hadley Freeman battled an eating disorder. She was hospitalized a number of times and spent much of those three years in psychiatric units. Freeman has written about that troubled time in an unflinching memoir about her own experience of anorexia and about the psychology and practical effects of the illness. Good Girls, a story and study of anorexia was published on Thursday. Hadley Freeman, welcome to the program. Thanks, Hugo. So nice to be here. It's lovely to have you on. Back on, indeed, I should say. <laughs> and, look, and look, congratulations on the book, which is sort of tremendous and moving, devastatingly moving as well. Did you, did you always know you'd write it? Uh, no, definitely not. Um, uh, I really thought I would never write it. First of all, I found the whole thing just embarrassing. And I also didn't just want to write a book about myself. That just seemed like the height of narcissism. Um, but now I'm of an age, and perhaps you are too, Hugo, I don't want to slur you in this way, where a lot of our friends have teenage girls. And um, I was just getting increasing questions from them um, saying, you know, my daughter's stopped eating. My daughter's constantly talking about her weight. You know, I know you've had this experience. What advice would you have? So I thought maybe actually, me writing about myself wouldn't just be me you know being totally self-obsessed as usual it could hopefully be helpful to other people by by explaining to them what it's like to be anorexic and how I recovered I mean yes I, I definitely read this book both with sort of memory of people I knew who had anorexia in the past suffered from anorexia in the past and also as the as the the father of, of two girls and it definitely does yeah as you say sort of um uh, well is, is is moving and effective from both those angles let's talk about your your experience, you're, you're very clear early on in the book that, that in your case, in most cases, in probably in all cases, there is not a cause to anorexia, but they can be a trigger. Tell us about that. Yes, there's there's usually um, a, a trigger, which actually has nothing to do with causing the anorexia. So for me, it was I was sitting in PE one day just after my 14th birthday, and I was sat next to a girl in my class who was very, very tiny. And I noticed that her legs were much thinner than mine. And I said to her, is it hard to buy clothes when you're so small? And she said, yes, I wish I was normal like you. And to me, that just meant not special average, you know, irrelevant, nothing. And I, I basically stopped eating that day. But obviously, she, that comment, which was meant totally benignly, mm. is not what made me anorexic. It was an accretion of various life experiences that just made me very scared of growing up and being a woman, basically. And you you say, I mean, frequently in the book as well, that the, one of the many things that people get wrong about anorexia, they think anorexia is about people who want to be thin. It's actually about people who want to look ill. Yeah, it, you know, it's sort of amazing to me how people don't get that. They they go on about, oh, these girls just want to look like Kate Moss when these girls are standing in front of them, you know, weighing, you know, appallingly low weights and are hooked up to, you know, force feeding machines. Like, I, I don't think they want to look like Kate Moss. Uh, those girls are trying to communicate how angry, unhappy, anxious they are without having to articulate it because articulating, you know, quote unquote, bad feelings is very difficult for a lot of girls who grow up thinking they should just be sweet and pleasing all the time. You spent uh, so a lot of this period in in various um, psychiatric units. I'm sure it's d distressing to remember. It may be distressing for people to, to 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 hear about as well. But tell us a bit about it. You write very powerfully about the the humiliation of it, the humiliation of the scrutiny you're subject to in a in a unit like that. Yes. Um, so I went. I was in various ones. So first, it was a um, a well known private psychiatric hospital um, in South London, and then there was a general hospital, and then there were various NHS eating disorder and psychiatric wards. Um, and the, the biggest shock, I guess, was the first one because I had never experienced anything like it. And you know, you are on bed rest all the time. You know, everything you do is watched. So you're watched when you eat. You watched when you go to the toilet. You watched when you're showering. And you know, on the one hand, it feels very degrading. And on the other hand, it is, you know, it was an attempt to stop us from being sick or cutting ourselves or exercising, surreptitiously exercising all the time, which I did anyway. Um, so things have changed since. There's now more focus on giving patients a bit more agency and also being more, provide more individualized care. So I went back and visited the last hospital I was in, which was the Bethlehem, um, where before it was very kind of, you know, no one's allowed to exercise, no one's allowed to go to the bathroom after meals for at least an hour, no one's allowed to do this, no one's allowed to do that. Now they they um, sort of make individualized plans where you cut down on your exercise, you cut down on being sick even, because they think if they just stop girls from doing this stuff, it's not a sustainable situation for when they leave. They have to teach them how to cut down of their own accord. 
Yeah, and you look—you write about the the community of girls you met in these in these various places, and you live. I mean, it's quite. I don't, is it open? Maybe it's maybe you'd say it's not open in your book as to whether forming this community is is helpful or or the opposite of, of helpful. Whether it's ena- it, whether it's enabling. What, what's your what's your view there? I mean, it's almost impossible to avoid it because you're you're in hospital for three to six months generally when you're anorexic, and you're on a ward with lots of other often teenage girls and then grown up women. You're eating together six times a day, all together. You're often sleeping in the same room together. There is no way it's you know you can avoid becoming you know cliquey and you know that's what teenage girls are naturally like anyway. And forming close friendships, you're living next to each other for six months, and sometimes the friendships were very helpful and very you know we could be supportive to one another and we understood. What each other was going for and other other times it was extremely unhelpful we would teach each other how to be sick you know teach each other how to hide our exercise routines from the nurses and also be very competitive and cruel to each other and there were some girls who would like to sneak looks at weight at the weight charts in the nurses station and say oh i i know i weigh half stone less than you and um or else go oh you you know you look like you're enjoying your food which is kind of the worst thing you can say to an anorexic so there was bullying and also support and it's really up to the nurses to try to balance it and the, the one of the most helpful things to me was once I finally left hospital for the last time my therapist said to me you can't keep in touch with these girls anymore which was very difficult because they were my only friends in the world because i had been out of school for three years at that time but it was right I had to stop thinking of myself as part of an anorexic community. You write with great compassion about all the people you met during that time and indeed as you do about the person you were during that time and almost with the same sort of distance what was your how to put this what was your mind state like during that time I mean you you also write that you you did keep on I mean although your schooling somewhat fell apart you did keep working and that made you unusual in that situation did you always think this will pass eventually I'm going to get better I, I did it first, certainly the first two hospital stays. I just thought, you know, this will be fine. Okay, maybe I'll, you know, I'll do my GCSEs out of hospital, but, I, you know, I'll go back to school for A-levels. And then once I was entering the third year of being in hospital and I was in on this NHS ward with women who were in their 50s, who'd been anorexic for 40 years and just spent their whole lives in a hospital, I did think, oh, right, maybe this is actually my life now. And for a moment, I, I kind of accepted that because I, I there was no other way around it. I thought, well, I can't bear the idea of eating in the outside world. So fine, I accept this. This is the only way I can survive. And then slowly something inside me kicked against that. And I had a moment when I was sitting in the, in the dining room one day and the, the 32-year-old woman opposite me was having a crying fit because she felt there was more butter on her toast than on everyone else's. And this happened at every meal. Somebody would have a breakdown because they thought they had a bigger piece of pie or more mashed potatoes than everyone else. And I suddenly looked at her and I thought, which I'd never thought anything like this before, I thought, I am not going to be having temper tantrums over toast when I'm 32 years old. Mm. And that's kind of when things slowly started to change for me. A, A big recurring theme that you write about in the book is this idea of anorexia both being a pathway to and a cause of delayed adolescence. You mm-hmm. write quite movingly about when you, you know, you, uh, the extent to which by, by the time you were ostensibly better and you'd, you'd gone off to, to university and in your sort of late teens and early 20s, you were actually passing through your adolescence then. How important do you think psychologically was the desire to delay ad- adolescence in, 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 in the root of your anorexia? I mean, it it is everything, you know, for the vast majority of people, they develop severe anorexia, they develop their anorexia when they're about to go through puberty, they develop it in adolescence, because they're trying to avoid being a woman, you know, there can be, there can be fears of leaving childhood behind. And there can be fears of also what being a woman means, you know, boys looking at you suddenly men looking at you, you're changing body, suddenly you look, you know, ready for sex when you mentally you feel very unready for sex. So it's very much about that. It is fear of what womanhood means and fear of what leaving childhood means. Those, those are the main underlying elements of anorexia, it, I, I strongly believe. And every everybody I know who's been through anorexia has had that same experience. And I've never met anyone who's developed anorexia later than puberty. It, you know, it might have gotten worse after puberty, but certainly it kicked in around that time. And I think that people really need to understand how hard it is for girls and scary it is for girls to be facing womanhood. You know, your body is suddenly very physically, visibly different. And it also means, you know, how can you stay that good little girl that, you know, you were once praised for being when you're suddenly becoming this seemingly sexually available woman and having to leave your parents behind? These are very difficult issues. And particularly if you're a girl who feels 
you're not pretty, you don't fit in, you're not going to be, you know, seen as sexually attractive. There can be, you can try to find a way out of that. Um, you know, in the 90s, when you and I were teenagers, Hugo, you know, there were options if you didn't want to be seen as sexy. You could be a goth, you could be a skater, you could be a punk. Those kind of subcultures don't really exist now. And this was a common theme I found when talking mm -hmm. to girls who are going through anorexia now. You know, you don't feel like you're one of the pretty girls on Instagram. So here, you're going to show you're not in competition at all. You're going to opt out entirely. You um you examine the similarities in the book between anorexia and gender dysphoria as well, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for all the reasons we're just talking about. Which is something that a lot of reviews of the book have sort of opted not to mention. <laughs> but it seems yeah. it seems very strange for me not to mention it because it is a sort of powerful bit of the book, and I'm sure had a lot to do. Well, may well have had a lot mm -hmm. to do with your 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 reasons for writing it in the first place as well. Is that fair? Yeah. Yes, and also my reasons for writing about gender dysphoria, which I've been doing for the past eight years now, because I could just see the overlaps for the teenage girls. And the fact that there's such a disproportionate number of teenage girls at JIDS, the um, only NHS clinic for young people in England and Wales, just shows how, you know, the difficulties young girls are still having when facing womanhood and why so many people want to opt out. So I interviewed, it's not just me pulling opinions out of my backside, as usual. Um, I did go off and interview three Ex, uh, three doctors who were formerly at the Tavistock, as well as various child psychologists and neurologists. And, you know, there's a huge overlap between eating disorders and gender dysphoria, particularly among teenage girls. And so many of the feelings that underlie anorexia, fear of becoming a woman, fear of becoming an adult, fear of being sexualized, also lie behind the um, disproportionate number of teenage girls who are saying they want to be non-binary or boys. Um, it's a very similar kind of motivation. And it, it is funny to me how the reviewers just are just <laughs> ignoring yeah. that chapter, um, particularly given how jumpy a lot of people were about me writing about it. So I think maybe we're entering a new phase of gender discourse where once it would have you know, led to my book being cancelled. Now people are just trying to ignore it. Now people just 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 skip that bit and pretend it's not yeah. there. Look, b before I let you go, and we, have, we, haven't, we haven't got long left. You are, I mean, this this book is essentially at the end, though, a, a story of hope. You know, you 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 do. I mean, you you have a, you do recover. You become an incredibly successful journalist, and really not a long time after you've after you've uh, after you've left you've left hospital. Do you look back on it yourself as a story of hope? Because if not, I think you should. Well, no, I am I am happy, but I also think. Sorry, I think it's really, <clears throat> sorry, I think it's a story of luck because I also think it could have gone another way. And I've met lots of parents who've lost daughters to this. Mm. And their daughters were very similar to me. And it was really luck. It was largely because my therapist at the time insisted I keep up with my schooling. I really do think if I dropped out of school, like so many girls do when they go into hospital, it would have been an entirely different story for me.